Let's talk about addressing health and well-being needs in Ghana. And to discuss this, I'm so glad to have with us Salifu Canton, and he is the Executive Director of Community Development Alliance in Ghana. So, uh, Mr. Canton, thanks a lot for joining us. Brett, it's my pleasure to talk with you this evening in Ghana. Yeah, and so you, your organization has done a lot to address both healthcare needs and just wellness needs in Ghana. Um, by collaborating with a lot of other organizations, working in the the uh, on the the community, like the small community level, uh, to get to get involvement, I was wondering if you could just share with me um, a little bit about uh, what the Community Development Alliance is, and you know, in your role. Well, Brett, thank you very much. Uh, it's really a pleasure speaking to you and to have this interview with you. I will start by saying that, uh, as you probably may be aware, Ghana is one of the stable constitutional democratic countries in the West Africa sub-region. Mm -hmm. Currently, the sub-region appears to be in some dramatic reversals in terms of democratic gains. So you okay. would notice that there's a coup in a neighboring country, Burkina Faso. There were similar attempts and coup in Mali, very close to Ghana. We've seen in the West African sub-region a return to coups and uh, uh, instability, particularly the jihadist activities, particularly along the Sahel. So that has been a major development constraint, yeah. not only in terms of security, but also directly impacts on uh, basically social services. Mm. Fortunately, Ghana has been fairly stable with a quite uh, relatively peaceful environment with a stable constitutional democracy, at least for the past three decades. Mm. Regrettably, the dividends of this democratic institutional or uh, three decade democratic experience hasn't so much taken roots and impacted the people, particularly in the social service delivery sector. So we still have significant impairments in healthcare delivery, particularly at the community level. Even though within the sub-region, we have made some gains, but there are still serious gaps. We have seen significant, significant investment in the health sector over the past two decades some with funding from a bilateral partner development partners like USAID, like the Foreign Commonwealth Development Office or DFID, like the Canadians and the, the World Bank and the IMF, all of them have made huge investments, ah. particularly because of the attraction of us, the stability Ghana brings to bear in the okay. West Africa sub-region. So there's been some goodwill from development oh. partners, particularly the United States government in supporting Ghana in many areas, particularly improving health, agriculture, food security. So you will hear food, uh, USAID Feed the Future program and the health system strengthening program and all kinds of programs. Mm. So with the investment in the health sector, particularly in the infrastructure of health, opening up district hospitals, clinics, there is no commensurate outcomes in terms of uh, reducing uh, uh, mortalities, maternal mortalities, and the five mortalities and prevention of uh, many diseases that continue to plague most of the people, particularly poor. Mm. So Community Development Alliance, our work is situated within this context. So we're basically an independent, not-for-profit, community development-centered organization that plays a catalytic role to incentivize the demand and supply sides of public service delivery to more effectively provide services that meets the needs of the larger majority of people living in poor or resource poor settings or communities. Mm -hmm. So ours is to try and ensure that no one is left behind and that uh -huh. the healthcare system that is provided 
is accessible to the poor people and that they are also able to enjoy quality of care that reduces morbidity and mortality, particularly in poorer communities or neighborhoods within the Republic of Ghana. Uh -huh. So our focus is not looking at infrastructure. Our focus is largely centered on addressing what we term behavioral impediments okay. to accessing healthcare, quality of care. So on one side, there's a clinic, there's a clinician, but those two ordinarily should suffice for a delivery of service. But regrettably, the attitudes, behaviors of both the clinician and what goes on in the clinic and what the perceptions and norms and values of the local people are, all of those factors determines the quality of care and how that is delivered to meet the needs of people. So okay. you can have a, fa a health fa facility set up, but if you do not take time to address these behavioral impediments, you will still find that we are not achieving the desired outcomes. Mm -hmm. So we, our discussion will be centered using one particular case study of a program we implemented with the support from the UNICEF, United Nations Children's Fund in Ghana, uh, which is basically centered on addressing uh, improving maternal and newborn quality of care services in the Upper West region of Ghana. The Upper West is one of the five administrative regions. In some areas, you may call it a county or a sub-state or something. In Ghana, Ghana is divided, was formerly divided into 10 administrative regions or blocks. Okay. Now, we, uh, uh, 2020, we increased that to about 16. Upper West is one of the regions in the northern part of Ghana. Okay. So the northern part of Ghana occupies a land area of almost about one third of the total land area of Ghana. And that area is also subdivided into five administrative regions. The Upper West is one of them. Uh -huh. So in the Upper West region, we have had serious issues of maternal mortalities, which puts us off track the SDG targets of reducing maternal deaths to less than 75 per 100,000 live deaths. Ours is over 400 plus uh, deaths. So meaning wow. that if women who go to the hospital to deliver, a lot of them, we don't get them back alive. So people lose their lives in the process of creating life. We thought that is uh, a travesty of social injustice. And we thought that we have to put in efforts, complementary efforts to address this. So we designed a simple program that focuses on addressing the behavioral impediments. First, what is the view of pregnant women? Why are they not visiting the health, the health facilities when they are pregnant? Mm -hmm. Why don't they, they go for antenatal care? Why don't they go want to have their babies delivered in a facility where they could have access to safe delivery and reduce the likelihood of infections that often will lead to those fatalities or mortalities. Okay. So understanding the demand side, why is the demand low? Why are the pregnant women not showing up? Mm -hmm. So we did a survey and we call it a petty corruption survey in the public health care delivery. Petty corruption because we understood these behavioral impediments to also have some corrupt motives. And those corrupt motives may be very negligible in terms of the benefits to the individual, but their impacts could be very fatal. Yeah. So right. what are these kinds of practices that go on in a typical health facility that undermines people access to care? So we did a survey across the entire Northern sector of Ghana, and we generated some evidence that showed widespread corrupt behaviors of mm. health uh, service providers that inadvertently undermines poor people access to care. Mm. So somebody's pregnant, instead of going to the facility, he will not, he, she will not go. 
because she doesn't want to make certain payments or doesn't want to be treated some way that is not right. So she mm. stays back home until she develops a complication. And by the time she's rushed to the hospital, she's half dead or dead. Mm. So those are the scenarios that we looked at. So when we did this work, we then used the evidence to engage the local health authorities. Mm -hmm. And say, look, are you aware of this? Because we have done this work together with you. These are our finders. Then let's sit together and look at the data and co-create initiatives that could help address or correct these behavioral impediments that undermines the quality of care you provide. Mm -hmm. So we took them through the data. We both agree on the data and agree on the facts of the data. In fact, they admit that, oh, they do also have some data that relates to what we do, but try to ascribe blames as to, oh, this is happening because of this, this is happening because of that, right. and it's happening because of that. Okay, fine. If this is happening because of this, that is happening because of this, what do we do to improve or to address this behavioral lapses so that service delivery in this facility can be courteous, can be of quality, and would we'll meet the minimum standard that will help us reduce the maternal and newborn deaths. So we right. work around those issues. Then, now that we've been able to look at the supply side deficiencies and agree with the stakeholders on corrective measures, we develop programs like Healthcare Excellence and Integrity Awards, which is uh -huh. a routine uh, assessment of public health facilities based on agreed uh, indicators so that if a facility is deemed to be meeting all the indicators, it is rated as a, a patient, a mother baby friendly facility with high integrity. So if, mm. you, if your aggregate score is above 80, it's a mother baby friendly health facility with high integrity. So we give you an, a citation or award during a review meeting. If mm -hmm. your facility doesn't meet the standards, we say this is a moderate or low integrity health facility, and we highlight the areas that you need to improve. Yeah. And so this kind of incentive gets some, triggers some competitiveness, that mm -hmm. you know that there is a ranking mechanism that could rank your facility as low integrity, moderate integrity, or high integrity. Right. And you'll be told where your shortfalls are. So that process triggered some competitiveness where we saw facilities even setting up grievance, patients, grievance, uh, complaint centers, uh, 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 doing away with some petty practices like informal unapproved fees and charges that some people were collecting that were undermining access selling of, uh, of medical uh, uh, consumables by nurses and midwives in public hospitals, which is more like dream business in the public space for private benefit. So a lot of it was so massive. So a patient comes to the clinic, he's entitled to some medication. They say, oh, this medication is not available, that one not available, that one not available. And the same health worker who is telling you all the things you are entitled to are not available, she tells you, oh, I have them, but they are for me, I'm selling. So if you're willing to buy, I'm going to sell it to you. But the one that should be publicly available to you, we don't have. So right. it basically created a situation where people were profiting at the expense of the public space they were working in. So right. these kinds of feedback mechanisms and engagement with this help them reform these behavioral practices, which we term petty corrupt practices that undermine healthcare. So having addressed that and setting up the Healthcare Excellence and Integrity Awards, then we also focus on rebuilding trust and confidence by these village folks in the local health facilities. So working with them to educate them on the need to have your baby delivered in the health facility as opposed to in the home. If you deliver the home and you experience bleeding, you, are, you will not get blood transfusion. You cannot have blood transfusion there. The environment may also expose you to infection so you can die. So it's better to have your baby at the, delivered at the health facility. So that is giving people knowledge, information that should help them make decisions about when to go to hospital, what to expect when they go to hospital, and what the benefits are if they get to a hospital, as opposed yeah. to 
staying in your hamlet, struggling to deliver on your own and dying with your baby in the hospital. So these things triggered an increase in antenatal attendance. We saw an increase in number of women who are preferring to deliver at the hospital as opposed to delivering at their homes. We saw a high number of women who are attending postnatal uh, clinics and actually bringing their children for uh, child welfare clinics and getting immunizations for preventable childhood illnesses. So mm -hmm. all of this, we saw the numbers increase. And that was significantly because of the change in knowledge and the benefits they, are, they would get if they opt to have their babies delivered at the health facility as opposed to delivering it with a traditional birth attendant who is low skilled and have low capacity to manage complications when they arise during delivery. So because of this kind of uh, 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 experience women, because in our setting, it's a close-knit society based on so many networks of relationships. And those relationships all contribute in the decision-making process of a pregnant woman. So we needed to work with these mother-to-mother -mother support groups. Some of them are mother-in-law, sister-in-laws, who prospecting a baby. So these are some of the, uh, so we give them training, what roles they should play, how they should be supportive and encourage their pregnant daughters or pregnant uh, uh, relations who they are taking care of to visit the clinic and, uh, and also and be able to access the right kind of care. Also training men in our setting, the decision for a woman to go to hospital when it is most needed has to be approved by the husband. It's yeah. a social norm. So when the husband is traveled and the woman experienced labor pains, she will still be waiting, expecting the husband to come before she seeks permission to go. Sometimes the husband comes late and she becomes a fatality. So you need to shift those norms. So liberate those women, have discussions around gender, the role of gender in terms of accessing care and how males could relax some of those rules without necessarily making them feel like they are giving away something, but letting them feel like, okay, we are actually accepting a new norm that will right. work for the good of all of us. So shifting those norms and mindsets that are uh, social in nature or cultural in nature and promoting what we call male involvement in maternal care, actually encouraging men to take their pregnant women to the clinic and, actually, and in that process, we have to incentivize it because it's a very uh, traditional norm. So uh, local health facilities have to do some initiatives of uh, incentivizing the men who come to the facility with their, uh, the women who come with their husbands. So when they come, they are given treatment early, they are, they, are, they are encouraged and they are made to feel comfortable that they've done something so positive and so nice. And so mm -hmm. those kinds of intrinsic motivations are used to attract more local Ghanaian men to accompany their spouses who are pregnant to the community clinic so that they can uh, do their examinations and give them feedback as to what their role should be in order to expect a safe delivery of a healthy baby and a healthy mama. So mm -hmm. those kinds of activities which focuses on promoting male involvement focuses on building a supportive network of mother-to-mother groups that can provide complementary services to encourage a pregnant mother, particularly new mothers, adolescents that get pregnant and uh, have no experience in pregnancy and childbirth, how to provide those kinds of support services to them that should enable them attend antenatal, make a choice of having their babies at the clinic and ultimately having a baby and mama safe and sound after delivery. And mm. after two years of implementing this initiative, we realized significant changes. In about 75 communities that we piloted this, 80% of these communities recorded a zero rate of maternal death. Whoa. There were very zero rate of 85%. Wow. So, so, of it went, it, it, so it went from what number to zero? What did it start off at? There were some of the communities. We looked at the communities at the baseline. Most of them, prior to the initiative, at least have three maternal deaths in a year. After implementing this in two years, 
seven, 85% of these communities recorded a zero rate of maternal deaths. Wow. Newborn deaths were very common. Newborn deaths were very common. And after implementing this initiative, 70% of the communities recorded a zero rate of newborn death, meaning mm. they are sending their children, they are, they, are mother, they are women to the clinic. The clinics are providing services that are quite friendly and courteous. They are delivering safe babies. Infection is being reduced. Mother's health is like significantly improved. Uh, management of complications has been significantly improved, then leading to loss, less losses in terms of deaths and morbidities associated to deliveries. And mm. so for us, healthcare access to health services is not just the brick and mortar buildings. It's not just putting up a big edifice, putting all the equipments there. It goes beyond that. The service providers from the supply side and the demand side, those who receive the services, must have the right frame of mind, must be prepared, must be self-aware, and must have confidence in the process they are going through. Then we can expect better outcomes. If you have nurses trained, you have doctors trained, and you deploy them to health facilities, and they are working with the wrong ethics, unprofessional conduct that goes unchecked. There's no accountability mechanism. There's no mechanism to get feedback from the uh, clients. Then you would have the facility, but the outcomes will still be poor. So for us as a civil society, we see our role as a catalytic role, as a critical role that should complement the efforts of government and development partners to ensure that we strengthen our community health systems, improve the delivery channels, incentivize the demand for services so that collectively we can achieve the desired objectives that we want in public health care delivery. Yeah, so you, you've you had support, uh, Ghana has had support from other countries uh, where Ghana has been able to implement a public health system uh, that's also supported by taxing the sale of goods and that the health health system is available to everyone, all of the public. Um, however, you see that there are definite disparities in terms of the utilization and the results of that healthcare treatment. And so, like you said, it re you go beyond just providing the facilities, the equipment, it's figuring out uh, on a community level, looking at the culture of the community and the supplier, what's going on that's creating disparities or equity issues or lack of utilization or not getting good results? What's going on with the mindset and behaviors uh, to, to solve those issues? Um, and this took an incredible amount of work and time, I assume. And uh, I know you've shared with me that it took a lot of collaboration with di different government uh, organizations, the healthcare providers, uh, community leaders, getting buy-in from them and involvement from them. Is that right? Uh, can, yes, can you speak? Exactly. Yeah, can you speak about that? Like, how? What was the strategy to make this possible? Like, who did you have to partner with uh, to develop the trust? The trust in the community alliance the trust in the um, surveys that you've done, uh, et cetera? Yes, very critical question. Like I said, if I would use the language in the petroleum sector, we have the upstream and the downstream. We have the demand and the supply side. So for us, when we look at the situation we are confronted with and what we want to achieve, we recognize that we should not be confrontational in our approach. In Ghana, civil society advocacy sometimes could appear confrontational. And in that case, people are more like uh, fighting each other. So we adopted a collaborative approach as opposed to a confrontational approach. And in doing the collaborative approach, we need to secure the buy-in of key stakeholders. So when we developed our initial baseline the information, we sought audience with the 
parliamentary committee, the Ghanaian Parliament's Committee on Health. There's a health sector committee of the parliament of Ghana, the people's representative. So we wrote to them and said, we've done this work. We would like to have a meeting with you and discuss our, our research observations with you and to see how you can use that in your oversight role on the Ministry of Health so that we can help improve those systemic challenges, those ones that relate to about legislation or policies, how you can do that. Then the parliament fortunately invited us and I went with my team, we made a presentation to the entire, they adopted the report, we made copies of the report to all, I think about 35 elected members of parliament at the, in Accra, we presented our research findings with them. Majority of them, or almost all of them, agreed entirely with our findings and says that even in their respective constituencies, their constituents have made such complaints to them about the unfair treatment, the inequalities, and the, 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 the challenges that basically cuts them off from accessing the right quality of care, of health services. And so they agreed with the, the, the report and, and adopted it. And so they were going to put it before the Speaker of Parliament, but made a firm promise that the challenge is with the, they, they, they only make laws, they don't implement laws, but they're going to use that information in their oversight function. So they will have meetings with the Minister of Health and demand action to address some of those issues. Then we are going to have another meeting with the Minister of Health and the entire ministry with the chief directors. We made similar presentations. They've largely agreed with discuss on modalities as to how they can help improve some of those things that require a higher level action. Then we met with the Director General of Ghana Health Service. The Director General of Ghana Health Service is the principal person responsible for healthcare delivery in Ghana, public healthcare delivery, both mm -hmm. public and private. He's the one that has the, 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 the direct responsibility to ensure or to supervise the provision of public healthcare and private healthcare in Ghana. So we met him in his office in Accra, Presented, and all of these engagements were intended to secure their buy-in and support mm -hmm. so that once they agree and we build consensus around the issues, that within our zone of influence, we will have the legitimacy to engage those duty bearers at that level and drive the changes that we wanted. So at the national level, we secured both the political and administrative buy-in from the parliament, from the ministry's level, from the uh, 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 Ghana Health Service level. Then at the regional level, we worked with regional directors, had similar engagements, shared the data with them, agreed on reforms or activities we need to do or institutionalize in order to correct those uh, impediments that tend to create the discrepancies or anomalies in the delivery chain. So within that process, we managed to build consensus around approaches. We managed to influence the higher level actors to support our program, to co-own it. So yeah, that co-own it. it. Co -own it. That's a key term. So that it is not appearing as a civil society activity, but that actually we are working together to improve their own mandate, to improve their capacity to deliver their mandate. Right. of universal access to health care to all Ghanaians, irrespective of their social, economic, political, or geographical location. Mm -hmm. That is the mandate they have. So we made it clear from the onset that we have to complement you, work with you, help point out the discrepancies as an outsider. We are not direct clinicians giving you the feedback from patients so that you can mm -hmm. reform and improve the quality of services that you deliver. Yeah. It is within that same framework, we co-created the Healthcare Excellence and Integrity Awards. Mm -hmm. And we sat together jointly, identified what the key indicators should be and the mechanisms of doing the assessment. We contributed experts from civil society, from the Ghana Health Service, from the Nurses and Midwives Association, to constitute an assessment team that will visit each of the facilities, assess them independently based on the agreed scorecard, then analyze the outcome and provide the feedback to all of them, placing them in different ranks. Those that have excelled 
we recognize them, appreciate them, and commend them, and encourage them to do more. Those that have fallen short, we say, look, you can do better. There are these are the the shortfalls we observe. These are the areas you need to improve. We hope that you can work at this so that at the next assessment, you will not be a low integrity health facility. At least you would have moved from low to moderate or from moderate to a high integrity facility. Yes. So yes. based on this co-creation, collaborative as opposed to confrontation, we were able to drive some changes that have uh, wow. proven to be quite impactful. Yeah, that's so important. And how do you think the results would be different if rather than the organization uh, that you're with, the community, um, uh, rather, rather than the Community Development Alliance doing this work, how do you think the results would be different if it was a government organization doing what, what, you, what this organization is doing? You see, the context in our country, government to government businesses are more, and are, 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 are quite, uh, people don't, you see, Government oversighting government. Already there are structures that are supposed to deal with these issues. We have the Ghana Health Service. We have the Ministry of Health. We have the HEFRA, the Health uh, Institutions Regulatory Authority. All of them exist. We have the National Health Insurance Authority. They exist. But because they are all government entities, the oversight responsibility tend to be compromised. In Ghana, regulatory authorities rarely and hardly hold their other institutions accountable. In fact, it is common knowledge that regulatory authorities tend to cover up hmm. the deficiencies, weaknesses, and anomalies they find in public entities. They only come hard in most cases on private entities that they are working with. But for public entities, it is quite very rare that you would find government entities being really, really uh, 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 pro performing the oversight function very well. So right. in Ghana, in many public service delivery agencies, the, 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 the drift is often tend to civil society and the media and the uh, independent, and even in some in cases, independent state agencies that have that mandate tend to be compromised because mm -hmm. of the, the challenges in our governance system. Our right. democracy hasn't matured to the point where we truly have independent institutions that have the capacity, the resolve mm -hmm. to do right at all times. So often yeah. you find state agencies not being that very. So yes, they exist. There are a lot of them that exist. They will tell you they are doing their role. They will tell you, but they will tell you, oh, like for example, when we met the health authorities and provided them evidence of the many anomalies going on in the health facility, they didn't even deny, they accepted, but gave reasons why that is happening. They say, oh, we have a health insurance system. The health insurance is supposed to pay us claims that uh, 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 when we submit claims of patients we have seen and we submit the bill to government, they're supposed to pay us. For over a year, they haven't paid us. So because they haven't paid us, we are charging extra, though we know it's unapproved, it's unauthorized, it's illegal. We are doing that to keep the facilities alive. Right. You get that? Yeah. So yeah. when a public entity that has an oversight comes to them, they tell them that they go back and say, oh, in any case, government hasn't released money, so the people are doing the wrong things is because of that. But civil society will have a different approach. Say, wow, well, wait a minute. But what you're doing is wrong and it's causing lives. Yeah. Many are dying as a result of your actions that are not approved by law. Right. So instead of doing the wrong thing, why don't we reform? Why don't we look at 
ways through which we can improve the reimbursement of your claims. We can improve, even if you have to charge people, it has to be formalized. The people have to be aware. They have to know what they are paying for so that even the money that you are collecting is not going into a private pocket, but it is being used by the facility to improve the quality of care. So mm -hmm. that will be a civil society approach. But because there's a government entity oversight and that government entity cannot go to suggest alternative ways to improve the system, particularly when they give an excuse that, oh, government is not doing A, B, C, D. So that is why we are doing B, C, D, E, F wrong. Right, yeah. They will relax. Yeah. But a civil society approach, which is purely independent of government, and in Ghana, we have, over the years, grown a very active civil society space. Yeah, and so and let me ask you this. Civil society space. Yeah, so how does the Community Development Alliance, as a you know part of the civil society, how does how, how do you all stay independent? How do you keep your resolve? How do you stay objective? Like, what decisions do you have to make so that you continue to be objective and uh, and truthful? Uh, you know, in your findings? Yes. We, we strive at all times to be objective and independent. And first, we do so by conforming to Ghanaian uh, law. There are significant laws that uh, prescribes how civil society should operate in Ghana and uh, conform to its own ethical behavior and conduct. So we strive to be that. Then, but for us, most importantly, we have avoided doing business with government. In Ghana, if you want to do business with government, you 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 risk being compromised. It becomes a bit, so doing business with government means maybe government funding our activities. No, we have stayed off from that, and many civil society in Ghana are not funded by Ghanaian government, and. And uh, the re reason is because the procurement processes in Ghanaian government and in government procurements are quite risky and open to corruption and could compromise independent institutions. So independent institutions have to have independent sources of funding, raising their own funds so that they can have proper oversight on government. So apart from obeying, uh, following the, the law, and being very adherent to the laws of the country, the other most important part is to be able to uh, attract or mobilize funding to support your activities that is independent of government. And once government is not directly providing the funding, then you have a clear conscience, you have a free will as a citizen-led organization to be, to, be, to, to be truly independent of what you can do with government agencies working with them and providing the uh, necessary feedback to be able to influence change in the quality sure. of services. But apart from that, CDA has also used one method of uh, uh, building what we call a, a, a community of, uh, of practice of some sort, where we get communities more active and own the process, not just like mm. the, yeah. the the few individuals working in the civil society pays by building a movement of some sort of networks, creating various community networks, youth networks, women mm -hmm. networks, consumer association, education service provider networks, healthcare consumers associate, and building the capacities of these local groups that then feeds into our processes to ensure that we are able to provide independent unbiased feedback that should help improve yeah. the quality of care in our public care facilities. Sure. Rather than CDA having all of the control and decision-making exactly be, be, behind, behind closed doors, you have a lot of community involvement where they have ownership and they help with the decision-making and the strategy and so forth. Exactly. So we have actually, for example, in the area of health for every community health, facility 
we have worked to identify and support the training of what we call community health management committees. These are local people, women, youth representatives, community local chief, and other minority groups. They constitute mm -hmm. the community health management committee. They meet once every month. They review the state of healthcare delivery in their local community. They come out with suggestions and they communicate same to the management of their local community health authorities. And then that is a feedback process. So we actually empowering what we call community health systems, networks, so that they can actually drive the change themselves. It mustn't just be seen here. See, there's just a team of a few experts uh, working on full time to promote this, but the real change makers are those on the community, the volunteer networks, the women networks, the adolescent girls and young women networks that we're building their capacity to drive the change that they want to see in their communities. Yeah, that, that sounds fantastic. Now, I have a question for you about telehealth. So in terms of disparities and equity issues around healthcare, telehealth has been a solution for a lot of communities. Um, and there's been a lot of investment into telehealth. Uh, but sometimes the investment in telehealth is not really a fit for a particular community because of their, uh, maybe because of their distrust of the technology or not having access, access to internet or quality cellular service. Have you done any work or research or worked with any communities around the use of telehealth? Oh, yes. We actually piloted uh, a, a simple telehealth initiative. We call it the SMS platform. The SMS platform, basically, we got the, an app designer to, we were doing an initiative that was looking at um, adolescent health, particularly access to uh, family planning services and also access to uh, HIV testing and uh, medication. And we realized that adolescent people in our area because of social cultural norms tend not to show up in most of the local community clinics for fear of meeting their moms or their dads at the same clinic because there are, are no adolescent safe spaces for them. And the stigma of meeting my mom at the clinic who would tend to say, oh, I've come to do an abortion, I've come to do this. So they will shy away. So we developed an SMS platform and created, trained what we call uh, adolescent uh, peer educators or networks so that an adolescent who wants to do an HIV testing can be connected to a facility or a provider where he can go conveniently at their own decision. He can pre-book an appointment, go see the midwife or the nurse and get an ATIV test and then run the test and get to know her status without going to join a queue that will create that suspicion and stigma around. Uh -huh. Or an adolescent needs a family planning device and doesn't want to go join the queue. So basically the SMS platform is a simple me short message platform that enables young adolescents who are, are shy and does not want to uh, to, to so much uh, be, uh, be exposed or get to meet their parents in the public clinic to connect with the service provider <laughs> without necessarily showing up. And even if they must show up, they book an appointment and create the right conditions that will enable them to do so without feeling the stigma or uh, the, the, the shyness that may have pre prevented them from doing so. And when mm. we piloted that initiative, we realized that it generated a lot more of excitement among adolescents in terms of the number of them who are subscribing to that and the number of them who are actually subscribing for family planning services, because we have a huge high incidence of adolescent pregnancies in Ghana. In fact, most adolescents by age 14, 15, six, later 16, they are having babies. And they are having babies not because they want to, but because they've engaged in sex, unprotected sex, without a family planning device or without family planning information. And then they, it leads to pregnancy and then they drop out of school and they just become a mother or they become a single mom and their education is disrupted and all of that. So, yeah. and, to, and to be able to help them connect to service providers, then we created this SMS platform, which actually became a good incentive for them. So we have piloted it. It did work. It was with support from one uh, the foundation, Ghana Costa Ghana Foundation, and they, they helped us. But after 
didn't scale up. There was a proposal we put together for uh, options international. I think it's a Canadian funding mechanism. Unfortunately, we we're not successful to scale that up, that pilot up. So we're still exploring opportunities, and we we see that it's one area that has a potential, particularly for the unreached category of people who also have a lot of because there's high mobile phone penetration in Ghana, particularly among the adolescent age group. So that technology could, if you're able to develop a simple telehealth initiative that uses mobile phone, for me, it then could be a mechanism through which you can reach a lot of people who currently are unreached in terms of the structure of our health service delivery. Yeah, and, and you decide to use a, a simple messaging system, SMS, like texting. Yes. Um, yes. And, and did you choose to use that because uh, many people didn't have access to adequate cellular data or internet yes there were it was one of the the factors we were our key targets were in rural communities that the internet connectivity is, is fairly low but they do have some phone access they can make calls and and all of that so we thought that if you wanted to reach out to rural communities where the internet accessibility is not very strong and you want to create a system where, so in fact, in the SMS platform, we set up a, 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 a network, a, a platform where there are service providers in that platform. So even when you send a message by a person, the, the, where it is coming from. Yes, like I, I said, the SMS system was, the main focus was basically to connect uh, people who, who, who are in need of certain services Right. To service providers. So these are service providers we have identified, trained, and know they have a higher work ethic and uh, respect the rights of patients and are, patient, are very courteous to patients. And uh, uh, we, we, we call them adolescent health uh, friendly uh, clinicians. So we have worked with them and then uh, had small MOUs with them and that they will be kind of resource persons and uh, so that we can connect younger adolescents who are in need of certain healthcare services, but are not comfortable with the structure of the community health yeah. facility so that we can connect them directly to these service providers without necessarily, without the, the, because of the lack of knowledge, a lot of them have even difficulty that they develop complications without even knowing because for fear of getting to the hospital. So we yeah. thought that- and why, why, way... Yeah, why SMS texting rather than just a phone call? Well, there were there were, there were were a couple of issues. We we're also looking at cost. Cost at text messaging is relatively very, very cheaper compared to a call. That was one thing. Then the first thing, the second thing is that call becomes a second layer intervention that once you send a message and then depending on the type of message, once it's referred to a clinician, he can then call you with a toll free line from our end. Then you can, uh, you can then have a conversation about that. But all you need to trigger an, a response is a message, a short message. And once you send the message, then the, it already triggers a response mechanism mm. where our uh, link person, focal person, can then even call you to, if depending on the type of information, to get an understanding that he can make a proper referral to sure. the clinician who then also can provide that that feedback. So the the costs and then and and the associated factors that the call should be the second level intervention, but the first, the primary entry point could be just a text message and depend mm -hmm. on the text and the information that is being elicited, then it can be elevated to a call and then even finally can ultimately lead to a face-to-face -face, uh, consultation with the, the with the service provider. Yeah, and the, and the SMS texting is not going to a robot. It's not going to a computer no. program. It's going to an actual clinician that's or an actual person that's been trained yes it's not going to yeah. a robot it's going to the sms message comes to us uh, uh, yeah. it will first be reviewed by our focal person 
who is a project officer trained to manage the project, yeah. then she will review that information, then re- makes the necessary linkages to the next person who has the right. expertise yeah. to meet. Yeah, so some companies use robots, uh, but okay. my experience with robots is it doesn't work very well and it gets frustrating for, pe- okay. for, the, for the patient. Have have you considered, have they considered using like an automated program with texting rather than a human, rather than a person receiving the text messages and determining what to do with it? A robot getting like a, you know, text messages going back and forth to like answer questions and triage. Does that make sense? Has that been considered? Yeah. Yeah. I, I get your point, but our system uh, was more human centered. I think we, we we didn't reach the level of using a robot that manages that information. And like I said, this was actually a pilot program to see how responsive it will be, particularly to the needs of yes. a particular group of people. And the pilot showed us that indeed, younger people are more friendly uh, to technology and particularly because of the high telephone penetration among the younger people. Right. They are more comfortable with technology applications than uh, the first instance going to a hospital. So sure. if you even want to get them to the hospital, starting from that point becomes an entry point entry that gets point. them to get the, the kind of uh, needs that they need. So yeah. yes, from that limited experience, we are convinced that technology is a key catalyst to improving access to healthcare for particular groups of people who who are who are locked out by the systemic inequalities and societal norms that tend to discriminate against them. Particularly in, in our country, people we refer to as key populations, uh, the LGBTQI group, right. a lot of them rarely, and in Ghana, because of the hostility against them, they tend to be on the ground and operate on the ground and, and, and barely show up. And so as a civil society rights-based organization too, we are open to defending all rights within the, 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 the framework of Ghanaian law to the extent that it's possible for us to defend rights, we do. So sometimes in, 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 in exploring ways through which we can actually reach them, because yes, we do have established contacts with some of them and we hear their frustrations. So I believe one way that can help open a window of opportunity for them to have access to services, the appropriate care they need, is also through telehealth. And I, and I think that the, those are our platforms. But that technology hasn't sunk deep in the Ghanaian society. It's still being piloted by different civil society organizations and some private health facilities. But there is a lot of prospects and opportunities in that yeah. area. That makes sense. Yeah, that 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 added privacy that it provides yes. uh, to be helpful. Yeah. Well, this has been very helpful. Um, yeah, and the work that you're doing is fantastic. It's a great role model for other communities. So I really appreciate you sharing with us how it is, you know, how did you get to this point? What did it take? What is the impact, Ben? Just your thought process of how to truly bridge the gap between the supplier, the clinicians, and the uh, the demand, the patients. Uh, looking at it at a culturally responsive way. It was very, very helpful. So thank you very much.